Oh, hey. Hey. Where have you been? I had to go pee. <laughs> Leave me alone. I saw this new video. Yeah. Oh, how are you feeling? We can do it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But are they ready for it? I think they are. I hope so, because this is a lot. A lot how? It's just a lot of information, and, you know, I can talk a lot, so I'm going to have to make it short somehow. <laughs> somehow. Somehow I'm going to have to shorten it. That's why I have an editor. Hi, what a new day, and happy 2021. We've got a new year, so here we go. The first full, in-depth episode of Loudmouth Birth Advocate. I hope you're ready. This may be a little bit fast and furious, because I'm going to plow through... Uh, 400 years of history here. So the history of childbirth in the U.S., it's going to be very broad, very much a, a history calls this a survey. There's going to be a couple of points that are going to be more in-depth. And of course, over time, we can come back and revisit all of this. Let me preface something here. This subject about maternal health is a feminist subject because maternal health has been negatively impacted by men with power changing maternal health and those side effects. So I'm just going to preface this with there will be let me call it a rant warning. At some point, I'm probably going to be, I'm going to get a little ranty. Um, this also can be um, a little triggering regarding birth trauma. Um, the notable information will be included in the description down below as well as at the end of the video. So if you want to go hunt down more information from these sources, that would be fabulous. Please get more information. I am going to mention more things in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and the 1970s and 80s. Because those two time periods, there were major shifts in maternal health and how it was delivered. The public reaction, the practitioners, there was just this big old conglomeration of things that influenced change. Um, it wasn't just a single event. So here's an additional preface. There are four things that flavored um, maternal health throughout history. One was the perspective of either the practitioner or the person in labor um, who had control over the events of that labor, the technology involved in the labor most commonly used at that time, and other connected events in history. Just keep in mind that anything that happens in history doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not just an isolated event. It's influenced by many, many things. So medical anthropology has discovered that in the evolutionary theory that when people started walking on two feet, the pelvis changed. See, we've got a pelvis right there. In future videos, I will pull out that. So that pelvis changing in order to accommodate both legs moving a made some some changes in the pelvis over time and therefore that produced what's called the obstetric dilemma this theory that um, what causes labor is the baby gets 
to the point where it's almost too big for the pelvis and so the body just expels it. There's been some evidence challenging that saying that influence is um, hormones and I'm already talking too much. Loudmouth birth advocate at it again. So real quickly, childbirth and especially midwifery, childbirth without a doctor has been documented in ancient Egypt, Chinese writing, Hindu writing in the Bible, ancient Greece. Basically, as long as there has been birth, there have been midwives. Midwives basically come from, okay, fast forward to native indigenous. There were midwives in their community. Wherever there was birth, there were midwives. And they had their specific practices along with the first immigrants that came over from especially Europe and keep in mind that these pilgrims and the Puritans and that wasn't the only uh, Christian sect denomination that came over but there was a societal belief that women were evil temptresses Women had the ability to convince people to sin. So this came from um, the temptation of Eve. And that continued into that society in the 14, 15, 1600s. A fast forward to the witch hunt. This was initiated by pastors and assisted by lawyers, eventually using a book called The Malleus Maleficarum. They called it the witch hunt because that was their, fo- it was a religious focus. Um, but it wasn't just witches or um, people practicing paganism. It also included midwives because They were able to produce good health without the use of prayer. They just used common midwifery practice. And it was also caused by women who had property without um, having a husband, father, or brother in control of that property. So how do you get that property? You accuse her of being a witch and you hang her and then you get her property. Along with these immigrants from Europe and England um, comes the immigration of ideas. So their flavor of midwifery came over. Um, The growing ideas about medicine came with them. And doctor was not a term that was used then. It was medical men or physicians that dealt with the body and a growing interest in surgery. Unfortunately, that education was very minimal. Physicians were considered quacks because their outcomes were really iffy. Many physicians uh, used medicine as an additional income to either being a barber, a butcher, adding into this history that created a conflict that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. The American Medical Association was founded in 1848. So as medical men started to see the potential for making additional income, they started to view midwives as a problem. Literally called it the midwife problem in conferences, in papers, in reports. They set out to figure out how to get rid of midwives because from their perspective, midwives were useless. It's not what women utilizing their services felt about midwives and the the husbands that saw the success of babies being born because Despite women being scared of childbirth, midwives, especially in the 1800s up to the early 1800s, had a high degree of successful outcomes. There have been 
historical documents of several midwives who had 80, 90, 95% um, success rate of birth outcomes, not losing moms or babies or getting sick or getting injuries, normal, safe birth. But when medical men started to intrude on the birth room, that's when things started to change. There were uh, professors and lecturers, um, one in particular, Dr. Hodge, specifically taught medical students to teach their patients to be fearful of childbirth. So they would feel like they needed a doctor. Because if dangerous things could happen in childbirth, you wanted a doctor and not a midwife. Before that time, Dr. DeLee and a few others developed instruments. Because they set out to improve the childbirth pain and the lengthy labors and everything that they saw wrong with natural birth. And those practices persisted. Another factor that poured into the mix of this was the public health movement about general public health across society. As midwifery became attacked, some midwives shifted towards the public health industry and became nurses alongside doctors because doctors came to control all of health care during the late 1800s. The certified nurse midwife was birthed during this time. They fought um, alongside doctors to malign lay midwives, non-nurse midwives, to the public. And even doctors themselves squabbled about who was studying the right version of medicine. There was also, along with doctors, came record keeping. Midwives were also moms. A lot of them kept journals. Some of them kept records. It wasn't necessarily a standard. They might take note of unusual situations. Here was a big shifting point. By the late 1800s, a new epidemic grew in the United States called childbed fever or purpural fever. Basically a uterine infection that could also by contact infect a newborn. It took no less than four studies for medical men to become convinced that it was not midwives as they had been reporting to the public over and over that midwives are killing mothers. Studies by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Ignaz Philip Simmelweis, Pasteur, Lister. Uh, finally, they started to understand that what was happening was doctors who were still studying were learning on cadavers during autopsies and going to a postpartum or a labor doing vaginal exams without washing their hands. About the same time, there was a print ad campaign against midwives comparing them to um, dirty and uneducated. A big part of this was a subtext against specifically immigrant midwives. Who were staunchly maintaining the tradition of using midwives. And by 1888, the American College of Gynecology and Obstetrics was founded. Okay, to speed through some more stuff. Thanks to a chemist in 1965, Justice von Liebig developed um, infant formula. So bottle feeding started. This had a side effect in society. 
Um, more mothers could work if they weren't breastfeeding, but also there were more frequent births because they weren't exclusively breastfeeding. And infant mortality rates went up. Maternal health declined. By 1900, 50% of births were managed by physicians, but only 5% of those were managed in hospitals. And part of the attraction for hospitals was anesthesia. Reportedly, Queen Elizabeth uh, received some magic medicine that gave her pain-free childbirth that reached the United States and mothers started clamoring for that same medicine. In 1910, the Flexner Report, a very substantial report, showed that 90% of doctors were practicing without education and most colleges were substandard in educating the doctors that they did. And the report claimed that obstetrics was the worst about this. These are the people that took birth from midwives who had been experts at normal birth for centuries. In 1915, Dr. Delee declared birth an illness, not normal. In fact, that normal birth was rare and therefore, all interventions should be applied to all births. These interventions became standard, and they included enema, shaving, anesthesia, episiotomy, forceps, pulling the placenta, hemorrhage medicine, because who wouldn't hemorrhage after all that, and the husband's stitch. The husband's stitch was basically, during the repair of the episiotomy, an extra stitch was put in to make the vagina tighter. In 1918, the U.S. mortality rate was 17th of 20 countries. During World War I, midwives acted as nurses. By 1921, 30 to 50% of births were happening in hospitals. At that same time, from 1921 to 1929, was the Shepherd Towner Act. The big push was to increase parent education for the care of infants in order to decrease the really awful infant mortality rate. But in the meantime, they also snuck in legislation to restrict what... Uh, non-nurse midwives could carry as medicine with them, which basically means midwives couldn't do emergency work. In 1925, nurse midwifery education was born uh, thanks to Mary Breckenridge, who founded the Frontier Nursing Service. That service not only focused on childbirth, but again, as midwives do, they did um, house calls to tend to sick people. In the 1930s, obstetrics became a specialty. They started charging money for their services. In the meantime, the mortality rate, it did not improve. Birth injuries increased and occurred at 40 to 50% of the time. In 1944, Grantley Dick Reed, an obstetrician, published a book about natural childbirth. Um, key to that book was the idea that fear causes tension, which causes pain, and that if you reduce fear, you can reduce tension, which means you can reduce pain. During this time, while midwifery was dying for the majority of population, for poor and black women, granny midwives persisted because doctors would not serve mothers that could not pay them. So the poor and um, underserved groups had to find maternal health care somewhere. That was granny midwives, descendants of plantation slaves. And those included women such as Gladys Minton and Oni Lee Logan. I am so grateful for those, those women that persisted with midwifery. In 1956, La Leche League was founded. That is a breastfeeding support and education organization that has been vital in helping 
mothers through um, difficulties with breastfeeding. During about this time frame, Dr. Robert Bradley developed a coping method that was focused on the husband being support. Dr. Ferdinand Lamaze developed the childbirth method of breathing, using breathing to focus on. And Dr. Frederick LeBoyer, his book titled Birth Without Violence, focused on the experience of the baby during the birth process and immediate postpartum, that babies needed warmth, quiet, not bright light, uh, to be able to make less stressful transition in their first hours or so. By 1960, the reported rate of births in hospital was 98%. Continuous electronic fetal monitoring began to be standard, and the birth control pill had come out. In Pithiviers, France, Dr. Michel Odont, an obstetrician, discovered that if you left a mom to labor without being interfered with, the outcomes were better. And since then, in more recent years, as well as the research of psychologist Helen Fisher, they both independently discovered the effects of oxytocin, which has been called the love hormone. Uh, from Dr. O'Dont's experience, it's what drives labor and makes labor healthy. It affects other physiology in the body to make labor function well. And Dr. Fisher discovered that oxytocin floods the mind when you fall in love or you see cute puppies or you hold a new baby. So now some of my favorite parts. The brighter side of childbirth. In 1971, Ina Mae Gaskin, along with her husband, and a large group of hippies founded a commune in Tennessee. And during those early days, they developed a revival of midwifery, essentially. She has since developed what is used even in the hospital, the Gaskin Maneuver, which is used when shoulders get stuck after the head is born. About this same time frame in the 70s, Suzanne Arms published a book called Immaculate Deception, which was part of the founding of my story. In her book, she described not the rosy things about birth, but the negative things that were happening in hospitals to and against women. In the 1970s, healthcare cost was rising and women started to take birth back. In 1972, the patient's Bill of Rights was developed, and damage from birth management was starting to be revealed. In the 1980s, birth centers grew, but unfortunately, cost and legislation in hospital care became more important over quality. In 1982, MANA, or the Midwives Alliance of North America, was formed to unite, um, including nurse midwives, but especially non-nurse midwives. In 1985, legislation and regulation against the independent practice of midwifery started, so any midwife that was not... Um, directly functioning under a, a doctor was being uh, legally pursued. In the 1990s, doctors started helping poor women more, very specifically because Medicaid started increasing those benefits. Between the 1980s and the 1990s, there was social and consumer pushback against the high rate of C-sections. In 1993, an epidural study had to be stopped because there was a high and distinct correlation to C-section. Epidurals had been used since the 1940s. In 1994, NARM, or 
the North American Registry of Midwives was founded. This organization developed the examination process to validate um, and legitimize midwives, especially non-nurse midwives. They developed the CPM, or Certified Professional Midwife, credential. In 2008, Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein released their documentary, The Business of Being Born. While this subject had been in society um, quietly discussed, this documentary suddenly made uh, the subject a lot more popular, a lot more public. Since the 70s, there has been a very slow incline in home births. After that documentary, that increase definitely accelerated. And now fast forward to last year, 2020. We got hit with the novel coronavirus, SARS-2. And because of this subject, a lot of women were facing going to the hospital in labor without any support. Some women only were allowed one support person despite the fact that there were there's been a growing amount of women that have gotten used to having not only their partner but family and commonly even a doula which you've heard me mention in a in a video before I'll link down below this scared a lot of women and while I haven't seen studies on it yet I have heard from some home birth midwives they became very busy once society started to lock down in reaction to the pandemic. So now the idea of home birth not only is becoming more legitimized and more people are using it, but there's more discussion about it. And then there's me. You're going to hear even more about it from me. So... That was a lot of information. We're definitely going to take some lighthearted looks at these subjects. Because who wants to be serious all the time? So, how can I summarize this? Midwives managed labor really well for a really long time with a very high success rate. And when the medical industry started to grow into the childbirth field, it changed childbirth entirely. And commonly in the past, in history, it was very hard for women to speak up. The voice of the powerful um, white adult male in upper middle or upper class, that voice is what was heard. So there was very little that midwifery could fight back with until women started to have more of a voice. And as there has been more gender equality, there has been more options for maternal health care. And I'm looking forward to seeing that improve even more. So if you've stuck it out to the end, congratulations for consuming all that information. So be sure to comment down below if there's a subject that you would be interested in seeing me cover. In the weeks to come, I'll be doing a reaction video reviewing a birth scene in the entertainment industry. We'll see how that goes. But more importantly, I just want to ask you to please be kind to all your fellow human beings, no matter their diversity. And thanks for watching.